I have a special guest on the podcast today. It is the man behind the <laughs> camera, 99.9% .9 of the episodes. But today you guys get to have a conversation between he and I, um, and we're going to discuss one of his, I would say your favorite sport, second favorite sport. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to talk about the UFC a little bit. Yeah. I love MMA. Yeah. So this is like, it's going to be a great conversation. Yeah. Digging a little bit into the UFC as well as um, digging into Dana White, who is someone we are both a fan of. Mm -hmm. I want to preface that as we get into this, because I think Dana is awesome what he's built within the UFC. Um, and as outspoken as he is for what he believes in, I find that to be admirable and something that I look for in, in friends and people that I look up to and those different things. Uh, but he made a claim the other day and not a claim. He was sharing his experience. Yep. And this was a conversation for Miguel and I to get into. He made a, um, or talking about his experience of fasting. And he had fasted for, there's a couple of different statements that he's made. It was 86 hours. It was 70 hours. And this was um, a statement or, or uh, video that he had made that really shook the I don't know, fitness, nutrition world. There was a lot of people that uh, took note of it and what he had said. And so I thought it would be good for us to have some conversation on it as Miguel is a fan of, of fasting himself. Yeah. I mean, first and foremost, did you see Dana White before, like maybe Dana White three years ago, four years ago, how yeah. unhealthy he looked? Yeah. He's lost so much weight. Yeah. It, I mean, it's it's remarkable yeah. how he looks now. And I'm 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 glad because... I don't think he would have been around for much longer if he would have continued on the path that he was on. I mean, it looked like his face. I mean, you could just tell his blood pressure was going crazy. Oh, yeah. He was like, like he looked like he was going to pop. Like if somebody asked him the wrong question, he was just going to explode. Yeah. Um, but yeah, his his transformation's crazy. I mean, six pack and everything. He looks great. Yeah, he's lost a considerable considerable amount of of weight and um, has gotten off a lot of medication, at least from what I've heard, because like his blood pressure medication, as well as sleep apnea and all those things. I think throughout this process of him losing the weight, he's been able to get off the medication and not using his sleep apnea machine or anything. Yeah. Pretty incredible. Yeah. And uh, the fasting, I think, has been a part of his journey, which has been beneficial for him. And um, I actually had a handful of clients who referenced it and asked if it would be a good idea for them to fast after hearing about his overall experience. Mm -hmm. And he had made a, a few claims in the video speaking on lowering the chances of, of having cancer and Alzheimer and other nasty diseases. And he's speaking to a process that is not specific to fasting. It's actually going to be something that is um, a, a process that happens after exercise and with a calorie deficit. And it is called autophagy, which is just going to be the recycling of cells. And with that, it's not going to be something that your the direct impact to those diseases is not just specific to fasting. It's going to be something that is happening after other processes as well. So when he is fasting, the autophagy is going to be higher, but as he gets back to normal feeding, it's going to get back down to what would be a normal baseline. And so today, I think it would be beneficial for us to talk about different pros and cons that you've experienced within your fasting, as well as what I've seen from clients and, and those different things within also the, the research, because I'm not going to sit here and say that I'm an expert, if you will, on, on fasting, but I do have a little bit of overall experience. And I think it'd be nice to share. Nice. Yeah. Uh, one of the questions to go back, you you mentioned your clients asking if it's a good idea. Have you prescribed that protocol to clients in the past? Is that something that you've done? So with fasting, I there will be periods that I will suggest fasting in different type of scenarios, but longer durations of fasting, I haven't really recommended to clients um, for a couple of different reasons. So with the longer durations of fasting, a lot of my clients are going to have body composition goals, especially gaining muscle tissue. And so for the longer periods of fasting, I find this to be a con or a negative for them to the retention of muscle tissue and then not getting enough protein in over that time frame. And so that would be a big reason why I wouldn't recommend it over longer periods, but there are going to be specific cases that maybe a 24-hour fast may be beneficial. Yeah, I think there are people that 
if you're training for a purpose, like you're saying, put on muscle tissue or training for a race or maybe a bodybuilding show, it may not be the most advantageous thing to do because, I mean, you're just, you're cutting out food, you know, you're right. only, you're going to have a pretty big caloric restriction at that point in time. So it may not be the best thing for them, but, um, you know, me personally, when I do it, I, f I find that it helps. I mean, I'm sure we're going to talk about it in this episode, mm -hmm. but it helps me with so many other things outside of just like the, the fitness realm. Okay. And, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's let's dig in. So we can kind of get started with no, we can get started with the the pros. So with those aspects that it helps you with, what are some of the things that you notice that are outside of the um, maybe the the physical part? Walk me through the the mental aspect because I find that to be probably the thing that it helps with the most. Yeah. So the longest fast I've, <laughs> there, it's funny. There's a joke, you know, like. How do you know somebody uh, is a person who fasts? Yeah, Th they're gonna tell you. Just like somebody who's does ice baths or does cold showers, like they're gonna tell you about it, right? Yeah. Um, I've I started fasting. I think 2019, 2020, 2021. I started doing prolonged fasting. I would start off with the well. I started for me. It was intermittent fasting. Um, I got into doing that because it was like, you know, I think there was like a trend in the fitness industry at that time. There are people like, I remember Brandon Carter. Um, oh, is. Uh, just, he's a fit, online okay. fitness coach. Um, there's this, the other guy who does, he's like, he drinks all the San Pellegrino. He has the the house. He looks like uh, Bruce Wayne's house. What's his <laughs> name? I don't know. Um, but he was always pushing intermittent fasting as well. You keep a lean body, you know, you boost testosterone. There was all these claims that, at that point in time, it was just fitness influencers claiming things. And now the science is coming out and it's been, it's been shown to have so many other benefits outside of just weight management. And the longest one that I've personally done was five full days oh, wow. of just water and electrolytes. And I mean, five full days being dinner, let's say if it was, it was Sunday to Saturday, for example, I can't remember exactly the days I did it, but Sunday night was my last meal or my dinner, Monday through Friday, full full fasting, just water and electrolytes. And then I broke it Saturday morning for with breakfast. Right. So in that time period, you know, you're going through so many different challenges in, in, in throughout your life. You know, you're you're fighting the urge and the desire to eat, which is such a powerful, like that's such a power like just the desire to eat alone is such a powerful feeling. Mm -hmm. And if you can overcome that, I, I feel like that you you bring the power back to you. And for me, the mental aspects and the benefits, I feel I just feel clear, sharper. Like the the cognitive benefits from fasting, even just for a day, is is tremendous. I get so much work done. I usually meal prep on the days that I fast, which is, it even ramps up the challenge as well. Cause you're like the aromas of food are around you and you're just staying disciplined. So one of the, the, one of the biggest benefits is for me, the cognitive benefit. Interesting. Yeah. So you find the, the discipline, like the challenge of the discipline to be the best part. Oh yeah. It's yeah. one of those things where like you, you're just doing something, you know, to quote Sue Gaines, right? Right. Do something hard, yeah. doing something hard for yourself. Right. And uh, it it proves to you that you can you can do hard things, and at the end of the day, it's just food. But some people have such a connection. Like I, I've heard so many times, oh my gosh, like I would die if I didn't eat. Well, you know, it's just like you you really won't. Right. <laughs> like you won't. It's it's a it's a mental challenge, but when you overcome that and you and you get past it. It's such an empowering feeling. Yeah, I, I, I find the the discipline aspect and just challenging yourself to be an interesting tidbit of fasting in general. Um, so I, I find that to be something, especially in our society, it's one of those things that food is just a part of absolutely everything, and it's we're very unaccustomed to only having you know one, two, three meals in a day. Like most people are going to have 
those three meals plus snacks sporadically, mm. snacks before bed, snacks in between meals one and two, snacks after lunch type situation, and just constantly having this comfort of being able to grab the food. And so navigating through the, the mental side is a really cool challenge and adversity. And I, I think that putting hard things into our life on a semi-regular basis, however we're implementing that, whether that be through our resistance training, through different forms of, of fasting, the, the cold plunge, for example, like these different things that just give us a little bit more adversity are good tools for people to implement, to stay disciplined within their mind and to be a little bit more calloused. Because I think that having a calloused mind is going to be a benefit to all aspects of our life to where we can work through more difficult things as they present themselves in our day-to-day -day life, especially when we're pushing ourselves to do these things on our own accord. Yeah. Um, one of the, I would say one of the, the pros to fasting or intermittent fasting more specifically, because longer duration fast, I think the, the largest benefit is going to be the, the mental side. And there's, there's spiritual components too. Some people do it within their religion and those different factors. We're more so, especially with the listeners of this podcast, speaking to body composition and improving those things. And so what I find to be more with intermittent fasting specifically is that the caloric restriction to whatever that feeding window is going to be is the opportunity to have better control over your food intake. Like there's just a smaller amount of time that you're going to be consuming food. Thus you have less probability or possibility to over consume the calories that you have planned for that particular day. And so if you are in a calorie deficit and you find yourself in a position where you are over consuming those calories, this may be an opportunity for you to tighten things up and have a different approach to how you go about the dietary intake. It's not that intermittent fasting is this magical tool that all of a sudden you lose the weight. It's the structure to it more so that allows for the person to lose weight and have better control over their calories. So I find that to be one pro, which you kind of spoke to. Yeah. Yeah. Intermittent fasting is exactly that. It's just a tool, I believe. And a lot of those people just need structure in their diet. Cause I'm the same. Like if, if you don't have a structured diet, if you don't have rules and regulations and put yourself in a box, you're going to snack whenever you want. You're going to pick up these bad habits and it, having this feeding window where you can say, Hey, I'm only eating for this eight hour allotment. Anything else is off limits. I think that just allows people to make fewer bad decisions. Yeah. I can agree with that. Are you wanting to hire the last coach you will ever need? Well, look no further. Physique Development is here to help you. We have a huge emphasis on knowledge and communication and making sure you know how to get yourself in the best position so you never have to hire another coach again. If this sounds great to you, then go ahead and fill out the inquiry link in the show notes or the description box, and we would love to get on a call with you. The other pro that I had, had made a note of is giving your gut a break. So this kind of goes back to the athlete of who may be eating 3,000, 4,000 calories on a regular basis and having a fasting period of even just like 12 to 14 hours, a shorter one can be really beneficial to just allow for their gut to get a little bit of a break, work through some of that food that has been sitting on their stomach for the duration of time that they've been overfeeding in the uh, goal of, of gaining muscle tissue, improving overall training performance, whatever the case may be. So I think that giving the gut a little bit of a break from time to time is a, a helpful tool that can be implemented within fasting. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. Yeah. At this point in my life, I'm, I'll do one full day of complete fasting, just water, uh, every week or two. Okay. And usually it's just, uh, it's, it, I, I don't have a specific day I do it. A lot of times I just try to tune into my body and listen. If I, if I have uh, too much food one day or if it, my, my stomach tells me, hey, I'm, I'm having a hard time digesting, and I'll, I'll say, okay, tomorrow I'm, I'm gonna take a break. It, it needs a break to completely digest and that gives me a, a good reset. I feel great coming into the very next day where I feel I'm not you know, just bloated and lethargic and yeah, it's a good, 
right now in my life, it's always a good reset for me. Okay. And I would say that the, that reset is a valuable tool, but can be abused, right? Mm -hmm. like, the, like the person listening to this could take that and be like, well, every time that I overconsume, I'm going to fast the next day. Mm -hmm. And so that's not what Miguel is saying. Yeah. I want to make that abundantly clear is that he's not using it as like a, a safety net for every time that he overconsumes, because that can become a very vicious cycle. And that's going to, we'll, we'll kind of jump to a con here of, of individuals who have had uh, a previous history of, of an eating disorder or things of that nature that have not gotten um, the uh, therapy or what have you to work through that and have gotten on their journey to recovery 100%, I would not encourage fasting to any of those particular individuals because it can be a slippery slope when implemented too frequently in, in a response manner like that. But I think that a tool, if you're going to consistently fast, let's say that you do fast once a week or you fast once every two weeks, it is a good opportunity for you to look at your calories and say, well, because I'm having zero calories on this particular day, I get to take those calories and put them across my other days mm -hmm. and I get to stay in the calorie deficit. And so that's a really useful tool for someone who's able to do that on a consistent basis yeah. and, and finding themselves in a position where it's easy easier for them to adhere to the calorie deficit because every Sunday they decide, you know what, I'm going to fast this day because I'm what, you know, whatever the reasoning is, it fits with my lifestyle mm -hmm. that particular day for me to fast. And then I can take those calories and spread them across my week to where I'm not in as much of a deficit, but because of that one day, now my weekly deficit is in that same position where I'm going to see the same rate of fat loss. So that's an easy way to implement the fasting and still be able to, um, uh, keep the calorie deficit in those different things. Yeah, I think that's one of the, uh, a huge benefit that I've noticed is I get to maintain a leaner frame. Yeah. Because every every week or two weeks, maybe three weeks, I'm implementing a fast. Yeah. And I have I personally enjoy being a little bit leaner. Um, I, did, I did cut out fasting uh, this past year, 2023. I'd, I, I did a couple throughout the year. But in the goal for the year was to put on muscle, like get bigger, gain size, gain strength. So I, I implemented fasting whenever it was like, oh, my stomach needs a break. You know, I'm, I'm eating a lot. But for the most part, you know, you know, now our goals are different. Now right. we're running a, a, a race. Yeah. Like we're runners now, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, composition needs to change. I need to tighten up a little bit. Yeah. So now it's time to ramp it up and increase the frequency of it. Yeah. So as we get into the, uh, Miguel and I are running a half marathon, yeah, April 27th, we will be running the Columbus half marathon. I, I don't know if that's the exact name of it, but yeah. we're going to call it that today. Um, so as we work towards that, how are you going to implement fasting with the performance being the goal? Well, right now I still, I feel like I need to shed a few more pounds of body fat okay. to feel a little bit lighter on my feet. Uh, because as the runs get longer and longer, I'm noticing, you know, I'm, my ankles, my legs, my knees are getting beat up and, you know, being a little lighter helps. So the goal for me is just knowing that I'm going to finish this race and I'm going to compete in this race. I'd like to be a little bit, a little bit leaner, a little bit lighter. Um, so it's just imp implementing, like I said, once, once a week, once every two weeks. Okay. Um, and I'll probably... You know, I've lost a few pounds these past few weeks as I've started being more consistent with it. And the closer we get to race day, I'll probably be way more disciplined with it. Yeah. Maybe do two days, maybe do three days. Interesting. Um, yeah, because I mean, when I first did the five day, uh, full full five day fast, I wanted, I told myself, I'm gonna do this every quarter, <laughs> which has not happened again. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's tough, but uh yeah, I think the closer we get to race day, I'm going to just ramp it up a little bit more and just progressive overload, just push it a little bit more. I can do a full day, let's do two, maybe do three. And um, yeah, make sure I'm still like nurturing my body, making sure I'm still getting all the right nutrients in for the race and and preparing myself. But I wouldn't, you know, I, I wouldn't recommend fasting and then running a marathon or running yeah. a half marathon. That's not what I'm, what I'm saying is yeah. I'm going to get to the point where once my body feels like, I'm a lean, mean running machine, you know, tackle the race and then on to the next thing. Okay. And like, will you run on days that you're fasting? Mm, 
I usually do light workouts. Okay. Yeah. Um, I've heard through people that are way smarter than me that it's not like if you are going to weight train to focus on strength metrics and numbers. So, you know, heavy weights, low reps, uh, that type of scheme, because doing hypertrophy and something that's going to cause a lot of, a lot of blood flow, it, you know, personally, I get super lightheaded, mm -hmm. you know, uh, day three, four and five, I remember I was, I couldn't bend over in time my shoes without like getting loopy, you know, it was, <laughs> yeah. it was a lot. I would imagine so. Yeah. So I tried to, on days that I'm like deep into a fast, it's just a day for rest. Yeah. Do some light yoga. I love walking, but, um, I don't, I, I'm not going to perform the yeah, best would, in the gym. I wouldn't think so. I was just curious of what your experience has been more so. Cause like with the resistance training side and it being recommended to lift heavier on the days, if you are going to resistance train on days that you're fasting, it's just because you're not needing as much readily available glucose to be able to get through that particular type of, of movement or the time duration or the intensity of that. Whereas like the hypertrophy work would be very glycolytic. So you're needing a lot of carbohydrates to get through that work. And so then you're just increasing overall inflammatory response because you don't really have the glucose available depending on where you're at in the fast, right? Mm -hmm. If it's like you ate dinner and then you go into train first thing in the morning, like you have the glucose yeah. for that training. Like that's not what we're speaking to, but multiple days into a fast, that would be something that would be more of a, a detriment than a positive at that time. It'd just be more stress on your body than what you would certainly want to have. I've definitely tried it. <laughs> I, I remember whenever I was fasting, I would deep into the fast, I went weight trained and yeah, it was like, this is the feeling of your body just like shutting off, you know, no, you're no, like, I you're deep into like, seven, eight, and you're just like, oh, my arms, you know, everything just shuts off. <laughs> yeah. So it's yeah. not, um, it's not the most advantageous thing yeah. to do. The last, the last pro that I had written down here was the, um, it's possibly better for your lifestyle, like from an intermittent fasting perspective, because you may not enjoy breakfast or have time, you know, specifically for breakfast. And it may just fit better for you to start with lunch or maybe, um, you're, it's very busy for you and, and having calories into the evening is, is better. Now, f when I think about this and, and we talk about like, it being better from a lifestyle perspective, trying to get adequate calories. And if you're someone who doesn't want to have breakfast and then you're trying to fast throughout the work day, trying to get adequate calories as well as adequate, specifically protein in the evening like that would be challenging. And then if you're eating a lot of calories before you go to bed, it's going to hinder your sleep. And so I think that it becomes kind of a vicious cycle to try and maneuver your meals in that way and would encourage that person to at least have maybe like a protein shake in the morning or something at lunch that's a little bit lighter on your stomach to keep going. Um, but if it fits with your lifestyle and it makes it more sense for you to do like the, the intermittent fasting or a feeding window, then I think that that's a, a pro to implementing the intermittent fasting specifically. Yeah. 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 I agree. Um, all right. So we can kind of dig into the, the cons, if you will, we've kind of talked about these sporadically through the episode. Um, I, I would say that the, we talked about it not being fantastic for athletes for the sheer fact of training performance being the goal and needing those calories to have the training output that they need to have. And then if, if they were to try an intermittent fasting approach, the volume of food, if let's say that an athlete is needing to have 3000 calories, trying to get the volume, that volume of food in an eight hour feeding window could be a challenge. And then we're running into gut issues. And then we're running into being lethargic because the meals that we're having are so large that we're very tired following the meal. And so that would be something where I wouldn't advise someone to um, have it in place. And then the, the other thing that we had already talked about was the trying to gain lean muscle mass. It's just not a, a great approach because of the infrequency of protein feedings. And then, um, being in a position where we just are having constantly low uh, quantities of amino acids available in the blood bloodstream for us to be able to recover from different training and those different factors. Yeah. So those are the the main you know pros and and cons of things. Uh, I would say. Did you have any cons that would come up for you? I would say socially, socially okay. that was tough. Yeah, I could see that. You know, 
I like sharing meals with people and, and, and breaking bread and you, you're that oddball out when you're like, can't have this guys. I'm fasting right now. It's just, uh, you know, people are understandable, but that's, that's definitely a con, you know, there's a social aspect, just like with bodybuilding, you can't have certain meal or, you know, you can't eat certain things or you're locked into a diet. Um, con could be i remember feeling my like not my blood pressure necessarily but i could i i felt like i was i could feel my like throbbing like my head mm. you feel everything yeah when you're deep into you know if you're on day three day four day five you start you start really like paying attention to your body a whole lot more and there were there were moments where I I you know I couldn't I remember day five I'm I'm editing a video and I like I couldn't even like stare at the screen it, I was so sensitive to so many things and I think that's part you know maybe that's part of getting that deep into a fast like you mentioned like a, there's a there's a spiritual connection in a, in a lot of those ways and I felt like I was so in tune with my body at that point in time that. Yeah, maybe maybe that was like a spiritual, like you know, it's possible. <laughs> you know, yeah. I was like, where am I right now? Um, and a con for me that I always complain about, and I know you've heard me talk about, it, it's like my extremities get so cold. Yeah, I think that's just you know the blood circulating, yeah, blood circulation, and electrolytes being off, those type of things. Yeah, that one. Whenever I'm, whenever I'm fasting, and it's like you know in the winter time too, it's tough. Yeah, like it's cold outside, and then you decide to fast. You, you'll see me like I'm at the house. I have like wool socks. I have sweats, a hoodie. Like I am bundled up that day because I just, I'm freezing. Um, I would say those, are, for me personally, those were the biggest ones. I One that came to mind and one I haven't had to experience myself yet, I can imagine it being challenging is having children mm. and fasting. I would imagine that to be very difficult because you're not going to have your kid fast with you, you know? <laughs> so then you're sitting down and, and making dinner and they're like, mommy, daddy, why are you not eating dinner? And it's like, <laughs> we're fasting. <laughs> and like your kids want to generally CBS. do, yeah. <laughs> your kids want to do what you do oftentimes. So then it's just, you've got to, being able to convey that information in a way that is understandable to whatever age that child is. And I think that that's all nutrition mm -hmm. when it comes to teaching a child about it, whether that be being in a calorie deficit or it be fasting or it be, you know, having some things that are not the best. Like how do you, how do you, um, manage that conversation? Like I, I, I enjoy having those type of conversations with parents of like how they teach their children these different things, because there's not one way of doing it. And, and I think that your parent is going to, the, the parent is going to know the child the best of like how they're going to understand these different things or possibly, I suppose. Um, and I bet that that's a, a challenge. If you were trying to implement fasting, I would say probably the easiest would be if they were doing it from a, a religious perspective, because it's just part of, I think that's probably like the most black and white way to explain it. But if someone was to be doing it from a, a health perspective, they had, they'd wanted to discipline themselves. And it's like, well, I want to be the child being like, I want to be disciplined. Yeah. Like, well, no, no, no. Like this is a specific scenario and, and educating on that. That would be an interesting hurdle. And I would imagine that that's a strong con um, of parents wanting to potentially implement fasting in some way. Yeah. Have you ever considered... So I've, I've done a handful of, of fast, um, really just like 24 hour ones. And I find them to be, and they've been in seasons where I've gone long stints of feeding, overfeeding with the intention of adding muscle tissue and being in a calorie surplus. So I've used them on the back end of those situations, um, and find them to be beneficial there. But outside of that, I find like the cognitive side for me it is more distracting to not be fed when I'm trying to work. Mm. Like I work a lot better and more efficiently off of like a, a lighter meal relative to not having any food. Like for, for me, I used to think that I was really good with fasting until 
fasting until breakfast, which we don't have breakfast until later. Mm -hmm. Like when you get here at like 10, Mm -hmm. we're generally eating breakfast. Um, And so I used to think that I did better with waking at five and then having those five hours of being fasted and um, working during that time frame. But over the last six months, I've, as soon as I've waken up, uh, or as soon as I've, yeah, waken up, <laughs> woken, waken, uh, woken sounds from, uh, woken sounds like correct, but I have, who knows? Who knows? <laughs> anyway, I've been eating within that first hour and it's just been proteins and fats. So I've had like a couple of eggs and some turkey sausage. Mm. And that has been so much better to my productivity and my quality of work because what was, what was happening that I was just like ignoring is that I would have coffee, I'd have water. And then probably like the two hours leading into us actually having breakfast at nine thirty, ten o'clock, I'm complaining because I'm hungry, but I'm like too close to actually having breakfast of like, well, I'll just wait. And then it's like, I have an hour and a half to two hours of very suboptimal work that I was experiencing. And so then I shifted to having that first meal at like, 6 a.m., 6.30, and that has been way better for me. So, um, yeah, it's just one of those things that I don't know if it's – and here's the thing. The competitive being that I am immediately is like, this is because you're soft because you literally (laughs) are just not tough enough to be able to withstand the mental – like the mental – have the mental fortitude to be able to fast even for those, you know, short duration of time. But then the – the knowledge in me is like, no, you're literally performing better. And the thing that you care about the most within the work at that time, you're performing better in that. And that's the most important thing, not being like, well, I need to be more disciplined. Yeah. You know, so balancing (laughs) that, that voice in my head is a a challenge. Yeah. It's a dance, right? Yeah. I feel like there's a, there's a dance between knowing what you should do and knowing, knowing the, the, the benefits and the science behind everything. Uh, I know for me, uh, these, these long fasts have been very beneficial in a lot of ways. I think I learned a lot about myself. My relationship with food has changed. Um, you know, there's like, I, I heard a quote a long time ago. It was, it was something along the lines of like, fasting is a, a full stomach, but a full spirit. Mm. And I, I, it, it resonated with me because there were times where you know, when you, when you break that fast and you like taste a strawberry again, it's like the sweetest thing in the world. Yeah. You know, like I don't crave certain things after, after a fast. Like interesting. I don't, you get past the hurdle. Like if you're, if you're doing one day, for example, you know, you'll have like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm craving breakfast. It's about that time you get past that. You don't, it, it's just gone. The feeling is fleeting and then you're just zoned in and it, th- those waves come throughout the day. And then at the end of the night, you're like, man, I'm, I could really eat, but I, me personally, I like to sleep and I, I love breakfast. So like sleeping it off and waking up and having breakfast the next day is just, it's the best. Yeah. But there's a, there's in, into those deep fasts, you find out some, I mean, you just find out so much about yourself. Yeah. You know, I, it could be that you're soft, could be. <laughs> it could be, but <laughs> at the same time you're 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 putting yourself through something that is yeah i mean it's just like there's like again my relationship with food changed right there's like there's some people it's almost like you're you're cultivating compassion for people that are less fortunate than you as well yeah you just you you tap into something where you're like you do what am i complaining about like what you know my body starts to feel better. Inflammation's going. I lose weight. I feel good. Um, it may not be for everybody, but I, I've also enjoyed. I, I'm not too vocal about it, but you know, I have friends that are trying it out now. That are asking me questions and they're and like, oh, I'm doing a full day, or like, should I? You know, what electrolytes should I buy? It's like little things like that where I'm like, oh, there's there's a movement happening now. It feels good to like be a part of something like that. So yeah, I think it's just one of those things that you're choosing. A, a hard thing to do. Mm-hmm. And it, it challenges you in a way that um, feels that it is almost expansive. Like you are learning more about yourself as well as um, 
I, yeah, learning more about yourself as well as improving the relationship with food, I think is a, a powerful thing. And I, I think that having those short list of things that you can tap into to challenge yourself in those different ways is very useful. Like you think of, you think of fasting, um, cold plunges, the, um, like the sauna running the, all these like physical different things. And, and people want to always have the, like the data of all these things do so much great for your body. And, and, and you have all these kind of hidden benefits, but not always is that the goal for every person in doing those things. Like just having the hard is, is good enough in some of those scenarios. Like being able to have that adversity is a good thing to have and challenge in your life. Um, Cause I find that with like the sauna sessions, like not everybody enjoys just sweating their ass off, like sitting there and dumping fluid. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> like I love the challenge of having to really focus on my breathing and just pouring sweat and having to really calm myself down. Like I like the threshold of getting to a high point of like anxiety and overwhelm. And my body is wanting to just be like, stop whatever we're doing. And then being able to pull myself back to a calm state. Like that is something that I thoroughly enjoy. And I, I seek that experience in different things. And that happens with running. Like I can get way too hot, like uh, um, hopped up with running and I have to calm myself down. And the same thing can go within resistance training uh, to a degree. I think that running is a better example to that. And then hot yoga sessions oh, yeah. are huge with that. And that is like, the if I was to be addicted to anything within yoga, it's the the hot sessions and like pushing myself to that point of my heart rate's getting up, but I, I am the one that's in control here that I can get back to my breathing and being able to calm myself down and, and being able to have these different experiences of calming myself down allows for me in times where, um, events are happening, whether it be work or my personal life, where I am getting more emotional and my heart rate is elevating and I'm getting more stressed. I know that I can call back to myself of like, I can calm myself down. Like, I don't have to just be in response to whatever is happening. Like I have the power to be able to calm that down. And that's coming from the repetitions through the things that I'm actively trying to do that are hard. And I would say that fasting, you know, falls into that category as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, you know, fasting is going to be more difficult for some people than, than others. Um, and you know, would potentially be even more reason to potentially do it. Yeah. And I was just if people are interested, just baby step it. Right. Start off with intermittent fasting. Stick to that for a few weeks, a few months, and see how see how your body responds. You know, if there's a feeding window that works for you, figure start. You know, tapping into some of that. And in uh, a personal friend of mine, he's he kind of did the exact same thing, and he's he's now getting more consistent with a full day, like at least twenty four hours, and he's found a lot of benefit through that. That's good. So there's. Sure, there's gonna be pros and cons, but to me, at the end of the day, it's just a tool. Right, it's just a tool to use, just like you know, a keto diet, for example, yeah. or a sauna. To me, fasting is has been just a tool to regulate my body and tap into something that is challenging that that makes me feel like I accomplished something really tough. When at the end of the day, it's really it's just a better relationship with food. Yeah, absolutely. If you are a bikini competitor who has competed well at the regional stage or at the national stage and not placed how you wanted, I would love the opportunity to work with you. If you would inquire via the link in the description box, that would be the first step. And from there, we'll get a call scheduled and I look forward to speaking with you. Um, that kind of wraps up our conversation on fasting. You have anything to share with uh, the people for UFC or? <laughs> we can have, <laughs> I'll we can have a little back. conversation. I know. <laughs> I was trying to bring it back, but I'm just going to hard cut straight into <laughs> UFC conversation. <laughs> Did Dana ever say how much weight he lost? I don't, I don't think he just said, he just said he got shredded. Yeah. And uh, for the listeners, the, it's not that he lost this considerable amount of, of body fat in that time frame. It's more so there was glycogen loss being the big part of that, as well as uh, fluid loss. And there's probably some fat loss that transpired over a three or four day period, whatever he ended up doing. But the fat loss is not the main part of any scale difference that he experienced. Um, 
but the calorie deficit for that particular week, provided that he was in a calorie deficit when he was eating food, mm. was probably extremely high uh, relative to his normal weeks within that deficit. So I don't think he ended up saying how much weight he lost necessarily, mm. but he he showed the pictures and you can see that that glycogen and water loss certainly happened. Yeah, everything kind of just tightens up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I noticed. I Within the five days uh, post- you know, post fast, I think I was down close to 14 pounds. Wow. And, you know, water inflammation, some body fat, maybe some muscle as well. But, uh, you know, it's a good way. And, and, and it's not like it's going to, that 14 pounds is gone forever, you know, like right. a few days back onto my consistent eating routine and I was right back up. Right. But I felt full. I felt tighter. I, you know, less inflammation in my body, fewer aches and pains and things that I was, you just deal with from, you know, exercising. Um, but funny story. Did I, did I ever tell you that I finished my five day fast with an enema? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds terrible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what an interesting self-experiment. <laughs> it was, it was a very, like a very weird self-experiment point in my life, but, um, you'd be surprised how much is still left in your system after five days without anything. Yeah. It's still, you're still working through you know, yeah. quite a bit of, yeah. Yeah. I was, I was shook, man. That whole experience, like somebody told me like, maybe you should try this out, you know, after the five days. And, and I was like, yeah, why not? Never done that before. I'll try anything once. <laughs> Dude, that whole experience oh was very strange, but they were still, there was still stool. I yeah. was like after like nothing in my system for five days and I'm still carrying that around. That's crazy. Wild, man. The body's a weird, <laughs> <laughs> it's a weird place. <laughs> but, yeah. I mean, how much fluid, how much fluid did you drink on a day-to-day -day basis during the five days? Um, oh man, probably, I would say it's, I started probably like a gallon, but I, it definitely ramped up after that because I mean, to me, it was like water, electrolytes, and, and water with Mio. Okay. Just to like give it some flavor or something. Right. And that at, at one point became like, I craved it because it's all I had. So yeah. it was just like ice. I was always munching on ice, just something to kind of keep me busy. Right. And uh, I would say like a, yeah, a gallon to two. Mm. But I mean, it was just like, just flushing the system constantly, you know? Yeah. Interesting. Um, UFC. UFC. <laughs> Let's is go. There, is there any... Uh, so? UFC is something I'm getting into. I've, I have appreciated the sport, but have not known a ton about it as well as boxing, like boxing and, M and MMA slash UFC have been things that I have just started really being a fan of for the last couple of years. So what's going on in the UFC world? Man. Uh, well, they're UFC 300s coming up, okay. which is a, you know, that's a big milestone. I don't know if they've announced all the fights on that card, but to be 300 full pay-per-views into this point is, I mean, crazy, crazy. I think they're becoming, you know, the biggest sport in the world, and which is, a, it's insane because basketball, football, baseball, they've been around for so soccer. They've been around for so long. What are you doing, bud? They've been around for so long. And then, you know, combat sports, which I, I think I hear, I think Dana White has said this in the past and a few other fighters, but it's such a primitive, like, it's such a primitive thing. People know fighting. It's oh, yeah. been around for a, it's been around since humankind, you know? So it's like that's why people gravitate towards this amazing sport. And I love it. I mean, it's it's not for everybody. It's very violent at times and it it's but there's nothing more exciting. Uh boxing as well, but I think I think as far as like combat sports, MMA has taken, you know, the the lead there. But yeah, yeah, UFC 299, 300 I don't know of, I think Sean Strickland and okay. Drikus Duplessis. That's the next big pay-per-view. Okay. Which I don't know if you're a fan of Sean Strickland, but he's growing on me, man. He's, a, he's an interesting character. <laughs> what an interesting character. Um, I, I appreciate his uh, willingness to be 100% himself. Yeah. Like the same thing I was talking about with Dana. Um, I'm, I don't, I'm not sitting here saying that I agree with everything Dana agrees with, which I also think that we're from a societal perspective navigating away from having to agree with everything that one person says to appreciate or like the person yeah, which i think is amazing yeah. I, I can't believe we got away from that but i'm glad we're moving back to it um so sean strickland interesting character i i would say that the ufc was not thrilled 
that he was became the face of that division. Yeah. But I think that they have been pleasantly surprised that he's been a better leader at times than what <laughs> they thought he was going to be at the beginning. Because I think at the beginning, they're like, oh, gosh. Yeah. <laughs> like, we did not think this was going to happen. And we would have much preferred, why am I blanking hit the... Israel. Israel. Yeah. We would have much rather Israel to stay the the face of this because yeah. of the character that Israel is and, and how well liked he is and those different factors. Um, but I think they've been, you know, in totality, pleasantly surprised. Yeah, I agree. He's he's growing on me as a uh, as a fighter. I mean, they're just complicated people. I mean, I mean, of course. I mean, these people just beat on each other yeah. <laughs> for a living. Yeah, and get their head bashed in. Yep. So it's like they're going to be very interesting people, different people. And then when they, especially now with like podcasts and everything, getting an opportunity to talk long form and really express their thoughts and express their feelings, it's interesting people, yeah. different people. Man. And yeah, so it's it's a it's a cool time to be able to have the exposure to these different athletes in a much different way than we would have even just 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, where they've got this opportunity to really express themselves and show who they are as individuals. Um, and Dana has always been such a big proponent of everyone being like, you be you. Yeah. Like you do whatever you want to do. And within obviously, um, you know, everyone's safety and, and, and being mindful of other people, but be you. And I think that this is, you know, now that we have as much exposure, it, we're getting that times a, a hundred type situation. Yeah. You talked about fighters explaining themselves and doing kind of long form. Did you recently watch the, uh, Theo Vaughn interview with Sean Strickland? Yeah. I mean, I, I've, I, I've seen clips, mm. so I haven't seen the, the full thing. So I don't want to comment too much on it. Cause I know that, clips can be taken far out of, of context, but I've seen a few things, but I've also seen just him being very vocal with his life experience as a whole. Yeah. Yeah. And it, I mean, it's great. Go ahead and talk about it a little bit. Oh, it's, it's just, he's just a complicated polarizing guy, but like at the end of the day, he's so, you got to respect him. He's so, he's so much himself at all times. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, he, he touched on, you know, his his trauma and mental health coming up and you can see obviously he starts breaking down in that episode and um i don't i'm not gonna spoil it but you know these fighters that have to you know this is their living at all times and like this and he's not the only one that oh, suffers no. through that um just making ends meet to like survive and, and provide for their family because it's all they've ever known like they're there's a, I love the psychology of fighting and fighters and like the the mental toughness that these guys and gals have to go into a cage or a ring, beat the dog shit out of each other, and then shake hands afterwards and say like we're the same. Yeah, you know that there's there's something so beautiful about that. And um, another fighter that I consider I, I, he's probably my favorite fighter of all time, George Saint Pierre. Okay. He's um oh, he's retired, but he's considered the the greatest of all time welterweight champion, and he he's a big proponent of fasting as well. Um, he he does three to five day fasts every quarter. Wow, this guy is like, and he's lean, he's healthy. Like, if there's one guy that has left the UFC and is and has maintained his integrity, his his wit, his athleticism, it's him. And he's like, he's such a proprietor of just like the healthy lifestyle and the martial arts about it. I think that's my favorite aspect about the guy is he's a, he's a martial artist. Right. He studies philosophy and different combats and he's well traveled and then this yeah. So he's taken I don't know if he's fasted all his career per se, but now that he's out of the UFC he talks about it pretty openly on on his social and everything. So it's really cool to see. Yeah. One thing I admire very heavily about all athletes is their ability to commit to plan A mm -hmm. and like not giving themselves an option for plan B at any point, you know, to get to that stage, especially within the UFC, to be at the top. That person's commitment to just the belief that they could get there is one of the most impressive things because a majority of people will never in their life have that much self-belief ever yeah. in any endeavor to like really 
like, because those people are also experiencing the same level of, of self doubt that other people are going to experience. They're just willing to push past it mm -hmm. and willing to continue to believe even if that voice in their head is continuing to talk and, and those different things. And, and I'm sure that in that interview with Sean Strickland, he probably talked about that a decent bit because he's had a rocky road to getting to the top. Yeah. And a lot of people, I mean, myself included, when he got to that title fight, would not have you know believed he was going to win that fight. I watched that in amazement as he continued to win round after round. And then to you know have his hand raised at the end was astounding. I mean, we were, we, I remember us talking about it before the fight happened. Yep. Of like, there's literally no chance he wins. I was like, put money on yeah, it, dude. Put He's money on it. There's not a chance Glad he you wins. Didn't listen. Yeah. <laughs> and so I find that to be one of the most admirable things and, and like the base of the just respect I have for every athlete that gets to the professional level is that to have that commitment to plan a and not allowing for themselves to veer away from that is incredible. And especially guy, I think of guys like, um, Cooper cup within the NFL, who is a receiver for the Rams. Um, he had, uh, he went to a very small school was not sought after from a draft perspective, but he and his now wife had fully committed that he was going to the NFL and going to be a great NFL player. And she financed a lot of their time through his college. And then also like early into his process of getting into the NFL as he continued to be chasing his craft and he c committed his entire being to be the best wide receiver. And now at this time, at this point in his career, he's one of the highest paid receivers. Wow. One of the has some, I think he's got a handful of different stats that, um, like most career yards are not career yards, but yards in a season. He's, he's had a lot of different things and he's very respected in the league as like one of the best route runners, one of the best receivers and coming from a place of like, that was not his destiny. Like in terms of it, obviously I guess was, but many people would have not expected him to get to this point, but because of the work ethic and because of the belief in himself was able to do that. And I see that in like, you can go athlete for athlete and there's so many stories that are similar to that yeah. and, and earn so much respect out of everyone should. Mm -hmm. Um, but <laughs> that's not normally the, the case for a lot of people. Most people are like, Dumb idiot, dumb athlete. <laughs> right. Don't know what they're doing. All bronze, no brain. Exactly. <laughs> Just go catch a football. <laughs> Just go punch each other in the head. It's you know, it's not that hard. Like, oh, I don't know, man. You should try it. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. I love, I love a good come up story. Oh yeah, man. Like, um, I've been super into Club Shay Shay recently. Okay. And uh, I watched his Francis and Ganu, you know, interview and. You know, hearing hearing Francis like his story has been, you know, it's been it's been talked about throughout the UFC, and now that he's be becoming, uh, you know, fighting heavyweight champions of the world in boxing, like his story is becoming more well known. And uh, that, I mean, that in general, like he started so late in his life, he's overcome things that people just wouldn't survive. Yeah, and to see to see, and he's had this belief. There's such a like you were saying before. There's like a there's such a spiritual uh, not to sound woo, woo, but there's like a manifestation power that these guys have. Conor McGregor's the same way. Talking about being a poor plumber in Ireland to becoming the highest paid combat sports athlete ever. It's just like these. It's it's beautiful, man. I love I love hearing that stuff, man. I love I love when people win, and I love hearing good stories and the sports psychology of it all, man. Mm -hmm. Like the 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 greats that. You know, in any sport, any discipline, you have a good story and you have a good message. Israel Adesanya is the same way. Like I loved him as a champion because he he talked about a lot of this stuff in his like post fight. It's just like see it, achieve it, believe it type thing. And it's there's there's like there's so much power in 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 that alone. Obviously, you have to put the work in, right? But there's a there's a whole other side of 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 uh that psychology it's yeah. beautiful man well else i mean going back to the manifestation tidbit I, I i find this to be something that is so necessary of like what you're putting into the world and what you're putting into your mind plays a huge role into what's going to end up happening mm 
whether it be something that you are striving for a particular goal and you're consistently just telling yourself that you're capable of doing so, like there's a much greater chance that you're going to accomplish whatever that goal is relative to the person who is just being like, I can't do this. There's no way that I can do this. This is going to be too hard. Like those things may possibly be true, but you continuing to reiterate it to yourself that it's not possible and that you're not capable, it's probably going to put you in a place where you're not going to do it. Yeah. And then simply having the aspect of like believing that it, it is possible. And, and that's why I love the story of different athletes and, and different, it doesn't even have to be necessarily athletes. It can be other endeavors, but to have one example of, hey, I was in a similar position. I had similar things going on and I was able to overcome that. It's just like having that one example is enough for me to be like, it's possible. Right. Like this person has has gone and done this thing. And if I want to do it, I can also do it. It's just a matter of finding my avenue or my lane to be able to accomplish that particular thing. And my avenue may be a longer road and there may be more pit stops or veering off than what that person had, but I'm capable of doing that thing. It's just finding that lane, finding the resources and trusting in myself that I'm on the right path from start to, you know, wherever that finish line is. And that finish line is always going to be moving. You're going to reach whatever that goal was that you put into place. And you, it may be unbeknownst to you type situation, depending on what the thing is. Like I think of, of different things that I've accomplished and I think, well, I, in the moment, I didn't even realize that I had gotten to where I wanted to be because I had already moved the target because I had already seen the progress and be like, okay, well, the next goal. Mm -hmm. And so you want to be mindful of those situations where it's like, I need to slow down and recognize that I did accomplish this goal that I set five years ago, but because I've, you know, distance wise of since I did it and I've had other goals and those different factors, I didn't even recognize or give myself kudos in that moment to have accomplished that goal. So I, I find a lot of, of benefit to just speaking positive things, speaking mm -hmm. positively to yourself and um, like not telling yourself you can't do things. Like I find a lot of, like I refuse to say I'm poor mm -hmm. or I can't do this or I, like any negative thing that I do not want in my life. Yeah. I refuse to say it even in a joking manner. Yeah. Because I, I really do think that if you're joking about it, you're still speaking that over yourself. Yeah. Joke or not, it's still happening. And so I don't even want to give an opportunity for the things that I do not want in my life to have any chance to exist. And that comes down to even the jokes that I make. And that was a, that was a change for me because I thought that self-deprecating humor was funny. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, uh, it was uh, an easy way to get laughs out of other people or to get compliments out of other people. And I've probably made this change five years ago. And I can tell when my mental health is falling off that I start to do it. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, we've got to, we got to get th some things back into alignment. I'm regressing. There's some things here that I've got to pay closer attention to. And so I am a much bigger believer in, in manifestation and just what is being said than probably I've ever shared on here. <laughs> <laughs> here we go. This is yeah. the first guys. <laughs> I know. This is the most sporadic conversation. Well, we start, we started with a topic. Yeah. But we're still kind of on topic, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. 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 Let's bring it back to maybe fasting. I mean, to me, the reason I got into health and fitness, I remember as a as a as a kid, as a teenager, first getting to the gym, wanted to take care of myself. Has always been for longevity. Mm. Like I'm going to, I'm going to be in shape as an old man. I'm That's going. Interesting. To, it's it's like I don't know where it came from necessarily. Like I know why I've always wanted to be in shape from an early age. Like. My my grandfather nicknamed me Gordo, which is fat in Spanish. Yeah. Like that's my family. My, my family still calls me Gordo to this day. And I think a lot of that has subconsciously influenced me to like, I'm going to be in shape. But you get into fitness and you start learning and realizing that it's it's about longevity. It's about like having a long, healthy lifespan. And fasting is part of that. There's regenerative property properties that happen i think i mean i i personally believe the body can heal itself and fasting is a is a way to clean out the cells bring in new cells uh clear inflammation like there's i feel so much better 
when I give out, when I give up certain things like that and tap into something that is more primal, spiritual, connected to me. And I know that it's, it maybe it takes time to develop that. But as we, as we grow and as we practice, I know that if I continue trying this, this, this tool, this discipline, it's going to pay off for me in the long run. Yeah. You know, so I think that for longevity purposes, I think that's another amazing tool. And I, and I, I don't know the science. I, I, I listen to smart people talk about this all the time that you're telling me that's anti Alzheimer, anti cancer, anti inflammatory, like that alone right there is enough for me to try it. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, a day or two without food, I can do that, you know, just to start. Yeah. Yeah. That it, it's interesting that you started resistance training and, and getting into fitness and everything with longevity in mind. Cause I would say that I probably did not get into longevity personally. Like I was, I was aware of it, but I was always like, that's eh, not really part of my goal right this moment. Mm -hmm. Um, probably until the last like year to year and a half where when I first got into training, it was literally just to not be scrawny, like not be skin and bone because of the athletic side of things. And my, my friends carrying more muscle tissue than me and being better at specific portions of the sport because of the lack of muscle tissue that I carried or th them having more muscle than me. Um, so mine was very centered around, like, I just didn't want to be small anymore. And I was willing to do whatever it took to not be small basically. Um, and realized within the last probably year and a half of me continuing to, to have this pursuit of, of running away from being small is not going to be like the most fulfilling process. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's going to have a negative side long-term for my overall health. Like me just continuously putting on muscle tissue for the sake of putting on muscle tissue is not going to be like the best thing for me. Not saying that adding muscle tissue is a bad thing, but just putting on, trying to put on copious amounts in the name of bodybuilding. Mm -hmm. No longer was something that was purposeful to, to me. Like I wanted to now be in a position where I can, I can run, I can, I can bike, I can do all these different things and I can be very strong in the gym. And I can have better control over my weight as a whole relative to these big swings of like, I'm in a massive surplus. Now I'm in a massive deficit and, and this big yin and yang to the nutrition for me. Now being in a place where I'm much more like centered in, I'm in a little bit of a surplus. I'm in a little bit of a deficit if I'm going for specific things, but most of my time is spent at a maintenance of calories and just fueling my performance and paying more attention to how I'm feeling and um, not trying to expedite the process of me putting on as much muscle tissue as humanly possible. Because for the first uh, eight to 10 years of training, that's all I focused on really. Yeah. Um, and to make that pivot has been much more fulfilling for me at this time in my life. I, I appreciate the time that I did, I had that being my one focus, it, a big part of what we've built here at Physique Development um, and something that I still have a burning passion for of understanding and, and doing for other people. And I, I still want to add muscle tissue in different places of my body. Mm -hmm. But at this, I, I'm no longer, that's like my only focus, you know? Yeah. Um, and so making that that shift, but that's where, I mean, I started of it just being like, I do not want to be small ever mm -hmm. again in my life. Yeah. Um, and so it's interesting that you were able to start from a longevity perspective. It's a pretty cool perspective. Yeah, I think we all chase, we all go through that period of obsession. Oh yeah. You know, or like that, I, I remember bodybuilding.com and looking through magazines and like seeing all these amazing physiques and like, I want to get that. I want to be that. I remember like never having a six pack and been like, I like, this is something I desired and wanted. And it's not like a six pack is like the marker for a healthy body per se, but it's something that I, that put me into the gym that fueled me to like, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to put on muscle. I'm going to get big. And, you know, years into this experience, I'm like, well, I'm, I'm gaining muscle. It's a good goal. I feel good, but I, I'm not like, I'm not Jay Cutler, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you have this expectation of like, I'm going to eat all this protein and buy these supplements and eat all this food. And 
and just get massive. <laughs> just, when it doesn't happen, you have to kind of pivot and realize. And I mean, for me, it was, yeah, it was, it was functionality. It was yeah. longevity. It was athletic performance. You know, I think those things carry and still carry a lot of weight in my life. It's, yeah. I, I want to be healthy. I want to be functional, you know? It's it's amazing, you know your 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 yoga journey. Yeah. At this point, I remember when you first started, you couldn't even sit oh, crisscross dude. applesauce. I was in so much like tension. I, I didn't realize how much tension was in my body mm -hmm. all the time until I started uh, going to yoga and practicing regularly. Um, to now being the place where I can sit comfortably crisscross applesauce. I can I can get into uh, different yoga poses much more comfortably and not feel like oh my gosh I may. Like my hamstring may just completely detach from my from my leg. Like it that is how I felt for a long while, especially starting. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, yoga has been such a benefit to my life, and I am feeling so much better because of it. But um, something I highly, I mean, yoga is a a great one. Yeah, yeah. Um, well. What a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> this was fun. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. I, I enjoyed having the opportunity to chat. If you guys enjoyed having Miguel and I just sitting here BSing and, and going back and forth, let us know in the comments. And we appreciate you guys abundantly. Make sure that you like and subscribe to the channel. And we'll catch you in the next episode. Peace.